flows or fluxes that you see in these diagrams. And things like human water appropriation, green water use, blue water use, they're missing in eight or nine out of 10 of the diagrams. And it's not just the diagrams that are meant for simplified for the public, but even the diagrams that scientists are showing to each other, people are missing. Now, do these inaccuracies, the, the sort of the misrepresentations from this lovely diagram, do they matter? Well, if we don't have climate change there, we're going to miss the need to adapt to climate change. If we don't see that there, if we see too much fresh water, we're going to miss the fact that we should be limiting or trying to manage the demand for water. And of course, the fact that we don't have people is the biggest problem of all, because if we don't see how people are affecting the water cycle, we miss the ways in which society is responsible for some of these major issues of water security, water justice, things that we can and should be doing. But if we don't get the sense that people are there in the water cycle, we're going to miss it. Now, um, great. You know, they, this SLU researcher has told us about yet another problem that we have with water in the world. We need solutions. Well, a lot of people at SLU are actually working on something called water pedagogics, trying to get the message, trying to get the, the public people in all walks of life, especially young people, to understand more about water, to be water aware citizens. Um, this uh, network for water pedagogics that people are involved in is funded by the Swedish Marine and Water Management Authority. And the reason they're interested, the authority, is because they're monitoring data about water available online. Basically, they want everything that's been monitored, all the data we have, they want the public, public, the public to be able to get access to. But what is the public going to do with these data unless they're aware they're water conscious citizens? Other water colleagues are filling the Baltic Sea Science Center with interactive teaching about water. It's an amazing place to reach out to the public with water pedagogics. Half of all the visitors to Skansen, this open air museum, visit the Baltic Sea Science Center. That's a lot of people, especially young people, as Skansen is one of Sweden's most popular, um, popular tourist attractions. And a part of what is taught at Skansen is this source to see concept as represented by this nice friendly cow here. If one's concerned about this, if one has, there are too many nutrients in the ocean, we need to know where they're coming from on land, with farms being some of the most important ones. Meanwhile, back on the factory floor of science, I'm working with colleagues and trying to create water cycle diagrams that work for the Anthropocene by including people and the many ways we're influencing water cycle. But I must say, we're finding it's not easy to improve on that wonderful popular icon, that simple water diagram. But we're trying to get it right. Thank you very much for attention. Thanks a lot, Kevin, for a brilliant presentation. And uh, if you have any questions for Kevin, please post them in the chat on the Path of the Platform. So now we move into our next speaker, who will be Brian Mackay, who is a senior lecturer in uh, uh, freshwater ecology at our university. So please, Brendan. Okay, thank you, Jens. Um, my name is Brendan, not Brian, but that's okay. Um, so now I've lost also, like Kevin, my ability to advance the slides. There we go. So in my research, I regard streams and their associated riparian or streamside habitats as key components of the green infrastructure of landscapes. Streams underpin landscape integrity by transporting water, regulating nutrients and supporting biodiversity. And of course, they're also central in the cultural and economic life of human societies. But it's exactly because uh, streams and rivers have this position at the heart of landscapes and at the heart of much human economic activity, that these habitats are often very highly degraded, impacted by multiple different types of stresses. And this highlights the need for management measures which can effectively address these stresses 
not only at the most local of scales, but even at whole landscape scales. And this brings me to a European project funded through Biodiversa, which has the acronym called Crosslink, a project which I've been coordinating for the last four years or so. And one of the core questions of this project can be boiled down to this, what are woody riparian buffers as a management tool good for? Or in other words, if you plant trees alongside river channels in highly degraded landscapes, what kind of gains do you get in terms of biodiversity, ecosystem functioning and ecosystem services? To answer these questions, we have undertaken extensive field studies in four different study basins in Europe, differing in the type of human impact. These range from urban streams in the Oslo basin in Norway, to more agricultural streams in Sweden and Romania, and finally to the highly degraded mixed land use streams in the Zwalm um, basin in Belgium. In total, we have sampled more than 120 stream sites and at each site we've quantified more than 40 different response variables to really try and gain an understanding of what changes when you have trees alongside streams and rivers in highly degraded landscapes. And I'm only going, to, only going to be able to give you a little taste of some of the things that we have been quantifying. Firstly, we have a set of variables which we quantified to get an idea of the potential contribution of riparian buffers to ecosystem service provision. For example, we were interested in, in whether riparian buffers help aid in, assist in uh, thermal regulation in stream ecosystems. So we log temperature continuously in both stream and riparian habitats. We also investigated how riparian buffers affect the deposition of fine mineral sediments on stream substrates. And as a supporting ecosystem service, we looked at an aspect of carbon cycling by studying the decomposition of cellulose cotton strips in both streams and soils. And of course, we also looked at biodiversity, focusing especially on aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates, but we also looked at other organism groups such as aquatic algae or diatoms. And from these data, we were able to calculate some of the ecological status indices which are used in the European Union's Water Framework Directive to assess ecosystem health. And I'm only going to give you a really, really coarse overview of some of what we found for these results, missing out on a lot of details. Basically, my focus here is on whether these response variables differed between unbuffered and buffered stream sections. And what I've done for these variables is firstly nominate a putative management goal. So if you're a manager who's planting trees alongside a stream like this, um, you might be hoping that those streams will help to reduce temperature variation and especially thermal maxima during summer. You might be hoping it might reduce nutrient concentrations in the water and sediment deposition on the, on the substrates. And if we look at our study basins, again, just this simple tick cross approach, we see that in the majority of cases, we have some evidence for these um, got management goals being met. For carbon cycling, we hope for more efficient carbon cycling in buffered stream sections, and we have evidence from that from several of our case studies. In terms of biodiversity, the buffers appear to be particularly good for terrestrial invertebrate biodiversity. And if we look at these indices used in the Water Framework Directive, we have evidence that riparian buffers include ecologic, uh, sorry, improve ecological status for invertebrates and diatoms. So all of this points to some of what we're learning from this project. We're able to go to managers now with a list of variables or uh, environmental and biodiversity aspects that they might expect could be improved by planting trees uh, alongside streams in degraded landscapes. We can give information about how much buffer is needed to have positive effects, both locally, but even how much forest you need elsewhere in the catchment. And we can say something about where it might be most worth it to try and re restore buffers in a degraded landscape. Um, we aim to publish a lot of this on our website, which um, hopefully will be made public later in the autumn. We've published a special issue on the project in the journal Water, um, which is freely available open access. And for those of you who want to hear me talking more about this project, there's a video on uh, YouTube with English subtitles. So I thank my collaborators and funders and the Crosslink Project Group. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Brendan, it should be. So uh, uh, now it's time for <clears throat> some perspectives from some of our more junior scholars. 
So, and I invite uh, my colleague, Professor Jenny Barron, who is a professor in, in water resource use and management in agriculture systems, and who's going to have. Sh we'll explore water technology nexus by asking how business can positively impact society. In just a moment, we'll be joined by an expert panel to discuss how innovations in data and technology. Um, what happened now? Sorry, what happened now? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> and we'll start this session with. I think one of our participants might have their microphone on. So please, everyone who's not speaking, please mute. That's great. So, please, Yanni. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's a great pleasure to have this uh, Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences team represented here at the World Water Week that normally, traditionally, is held in Stockholm every year with thousands of participants from all over the world. And I'm a, uh, the, the World Water Week has made a special effort to try to engage with early career and youth. And uh, um, I'm very happy to have two of our uh, junior colleagues and early career researchers with us here. So, uh, Lufunio and Amelie, uh, would you please just shortly introduce yourself, please? Lufunio. Yes, uh, my name is Lufunio Rolandala. I am a Tanzanian PhD student at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences at uh, the Department of Forest Ecology and Management. Amelie, please. So my name is Amelie and I'm originally from France. Uh, and I'm currently working as a postdoc at the Department of Aquatic Sciences and Assessment at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And uh, Lufunio, I'll start with you and ask you, so um, uh, what do you do in terms of water-related research uh, at SLU that you find is uh, important for, for contributing to some of these global issues on water that we are dealing with today? Yes, uh, I'm doing uh, research on um, uh, trying to solve this uh, water problem, which is currently a global uh, crisis. And uh, my research is particularly uh, centered on the tropical drylands. And the idea is to find a way to increase uh, underground water recharge. Uh, because we know with this climate change that uh, it's almost no longer possible to rely uh, sustainably on surface water reservoirs because of uh, uh, extreme temperatures. And uh, so we have uh, very high evapotranspiration. And we decided to go uh, towards uh, improving underground water recharge as a sustainable water storage option. That's really interesting. And it's directly related to some of those parts of the, the global water balance cycle that Kevin was speaking about yeah. today and trying to see how the land use influenced the water use. Amelie, I would turn to you and say, why did you choose? You're, you're French. I'm not sure if you're based in France still, uh, but why did you choose to come to SLU to study uh, the aquatic sciences? Um, I think it's because SLU is a leading university in applied research, which I was really uh, interested in when I decided to uh, continue and start a PhD. And um, so that's the first reason why I checked SLU website really was like applied science. And actually the fact that SLU is, has this very applied um, side uh, allowed me to collaborate with various stakeholders at different uh, scales uh, within Sweden, but also uh, internationally. Um, and I think also uh, my department is also hosting the, um, uh, the environmental, uh, the biomonitoring programs. And uh, it was really attractive uh, to work uh, really in this, uh, kind of interface that I could feel that my research could be used for the society. Thank you so much for bringing these perspectives on, on the more day-to-day -day work that is being done on water issues at SLU. And I hope that we will hear more about your re research as it develops in the coming years. Thanks so much, Amelie. And Thank Lufunio. you. I'll hand over to Jens, please. Thanks a lot, Jenny, Lufunio and Amelie. 
So I'll remove you from the spotlight and we're gonna have our next uh, slot of, of uh, pitch talks in which we first gonna hear uh, something from my colleague, uh, Anna CK. So I'm gonna put you on spotlight here in, in just a minute. So there it is. Uh, Anna, she is a researcher in aquatic microbiology at the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. So please, Anna. <coughs> Hi, welcome. So I would like to start with the figure from Jens that we started this session. Uh, and I would like to focus a bit into this figure on urban settlements and uh, talk a bit about what we all know, what we need as humans, as we are most, most of us, we are located in this red part of this figure. We know that we all need clean water, to survive here, and we all produce wastewater, sewage that we need to treat and we discard and we need to treat to safely return to the nature. But I want to focus on another aspect of this wastewater, that is that this wastewater is not only a nu nuisance that we have to get rid in the safest way possible, but it's also a gold mine for public health as it holds the imprint of how we are in this red part here. What do I mean here? What I mean is that uh, there is a field called wastewater-based epidemiology. Oh, sorry, what happened? Okay, meanwhile, I'm, I'm really sorry, my PowerPoint collapsed here. So wastewater-based epidemiology, I will restart my slides as soon as I manage, is a field that studies wastewater from a completely different aspect. So we don't look at wastewater only as a nuance that has to be discarded and uh, returned safely to the environment, but we also look at this as an imprint of our human health. Okay. I'm Coming back in a second. So sharing my screen again. Okay. So, so this wastewater can inform us about many, many things about uh, human health. It can inform us about what kind of uh, uh, food we eat, what kind of drugs we take, both pharmaceuticals and illegal drugs. It can inform us about what kind of environmental uh, uh, contaminations were we exposed to, but, but it also can inform us about the pathogens that are infecting us. And to analyze all this, we need a truly multidisciplinary uh, team. We have to be good in water chemistry, in molecular biology, microbiology. We have to know about water sanitation and we have to understand the meaning from a public health perspective. The focus on, on our work right now is on pathogen surveillance because of course of the pandemic that makes us now enjoy this session on Zoom and not in real life. Uh, and uh, this focus is important now because the pandemic has pointed out to, to many people who before didn't take wastewater in, in this manner of using it as a public health informative tool, uh, showed us that when testing is limited, wastewater can give us an overview of a whole population infection status. It can inform us of both symptomatic and asymptomatic, it can inform us of the quantity of virus in the population, also of the quality, the sequences, the variants circulating, and can help us uh, guide public health response. Accordingly, in SLU with my team, we have started this kind of monitoring of wastewater in Sweden, especially in our own town in Uppsala. And by doing weekly measurements, we were able to predict both the second and the third wave of the pandemic, one to two weeks before it started, we already saw the uptick of the virus content in the wastewater. We report this uh, information 
uh, on a weekly basis on public that data portals, and we report it to the most important authorities that need to know this, prepare hospital capacity, and so on. But I mentioned at the beginning, or maybe that's when my slides collapse, but uh, another good thing of wastewater epidemiology is that it's a very affordable thing. So we can test a whole population with a single sample compared to doing mass testing of thousands or hundred thousands of people. This affordability can help us uh, also in uh, using this tool for disadvantaged communities. For example, we had a project within Uppsala where we looked at uh, socioeconomic disparities uh, connected to the pandemic. We know that the pandemic, although everyone was susceptible at the beginning, it didn't impact equally different parts of the society. Um, those workers who couldn't work from home were much more exposed to the pandemic. Families living in crowded settlements were more exposed to pass the virus to each other. So there was a socioeconomic gradient in the impact of the pandemic. This was also due to different levels of access to pandemic mitigation tools, for example, testing. In an early study back in autumn 2020, the group I worked together showed that, uh, for example, immigrant background people in Sweden had uh, been tested at a lower frequency than those that were born in Sweden. So to bridge this kind of problems, we initiated a project where we test certain neighborhoods of our town. And uh, we do this through wastewater pump stations. So we sample wastewater pump stations and we are able to see the local infection rates. This tool allows us to identify outbreaks and then do a coordinated response locally at those locations. For example, by sending there a testing bus to make the testing access higher. So finally, as we have recognized globally and at SLU, how important it is to look at wastewater also as a, as a tool to inform us about public health. We, have, we are this uh, September launching a new center within uh, SLU, the Swedish Environmental Epidemiology Center and in collaboration with other Swedish universities where we will focus on the use of this kind of tools, build a capacity, a laboratory, where this kind of analysis can be done that will be open for other researchers too, and where we also hope to educate the future scientists in wastewater-based epidemiology. We are already collaborating with, for example, low-income countries such as Uganda, where we are running now a pilot uh, study, and Sudan, and uh, because we think as an affordable tool is a very good way to have these otherwise uh, uh, less equipped uh, countries to fight this pandemic. So that's all what I have. Sorry for this technical issue. And thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thanks a lot, Anna. Thanks a lot for your presentation. And um, now you can, as I said, post your questions to Anna or any of the presenters and speakers in the Pathable chat. Uh, now we move to something completely different. It's another Anna, but uh, her name is Anna Gordmark, and she is a professor at SLU as well, working on uh, community and food web ecology, focusing on water and climate change, I believe. So please, Anna. Thank you very much. And hi, everybody. I'm very happy that you're all here. I hope you can see my screen. And I will be talking about the warming that I'm sure you're all aware are heating up our oceans and the living organisms in the oceans. So the speed of this warming is increasing. They projected and already experienced warming of the surface of the globe it's heating up the oceans because the oceans have observed more than 90% of this additional heating that we've created with the climate change. This is making the oceans 
warmer, but not only warmer, it's changing the ocean habitats in numerous ways. It makes the water contain less oxygen, it lowers the pH in the ocean, it's altering ocean circulations, extreme weather, there's a numerous ways that it's impacting the ocean habitats. So the ocean environment is already changing with global warming and these changes will fasten. The warming alone is affecting all organisms. All living organisms are affected by temperature because biological and chemical processes all depend on temperature. So the warming is increasing the metabolism of species, so the kind of pace of life that sets the speed of processes in all living organisms. We know that affects the physiology of individuals living in aquatic environments. So the question is, how does this warming affect fish and ocean food webs and in the long run our food production from the ocean? And this is what we are researching at one of the things that we are researching at SLU and in our research group. We are combining experiments to study this, ranging from a scale from laboratory aquarium experiments to large scale artificial lakes in the or enclosures in the coast, as you can see, uh, combined with the large scale survey fishing that SLU has as this unique task. We are surveying lakes all across Sweden, coastal areas and the ocean and in the seas around Sweden. And we're combining this with measurements in the laboratory, for example, of fish growth by looking at fish bones and calculating and measuring annual growth rings, just like trees. In the picture you see up there, you see a bone from a fish. And in the end, we combine these data to help us build mathematical models where we simulate and study impacts of warming of whole food webs. So what this research is showing us that there are three major ways that warming is impacting fish and ocean food webs. So warming leads to faster growth of at least warm adapted species of fish, but not all fish, predominantly of the small individuals the larger individuals in fish populations are usually performing poorer in the warmer environment. They are not growing faster. In some cases, for some species, sex and sizes are actually growing slower. And in really warm environments, we can also see an increased mortality. Now, this leads in total to that less fish biomass is being produced from fish populations in warm environments because the fish populations are dominated not by the large individuals anymore, but by the smaller individuals in the populations. So this affects food production, fish production, but it also affects the interactions between species of fish and their prey in lakes and oceans. So what was the third and most important part that we see is that we also see an increased risk of collapse of predatory fish populations because warming has altered the size structure and therefore the interactions among species. So warming has profound effects on fish and ocean food webs, and this has consequences for fisheries and food production. So this picture shows you model projections, not done by us, but in an FAO study of global fisheries production. So the percent change in the catch in less than 30 years from now in 2050, and red shows decreases and blue shows increases. So what you might notice if you're fast is that there are large regional differences. We see some increases mostly in polar regions where you see the blue areas, but in large parts of the world we're expecting decreases, the red areas. And another very important message from this graph is that these large differences, the red declines, they occur in the areas where we currently have most humans living. And also these areas are the ones on the globe where we have the projected fastest increase in the population. This means we're gonna see decreased fish catches, but increased population numbers in these areas. This is a risk to food security. It also poses a risk that we will be seeing increasing international conflicts over fisheries and an increase in illegal fisheries. Illegal fishing. So obviously this needs solutions, not only mitigate global warming, but more immediate solutions for the fisheries production. And here are three examples from SLU research on solutions. 
on three different fronts on this. One is on how do we adapt fishing practices to the global warming impacts that are already occurring and will be occurring. One thing that we're doing is modeling to evaluate species and site specific sensitivities to fishing under warming. Another regular thing, as mentioned by Jens, what we do is we advise EU fisheries management, uh, a lot of people is involved in that, uh, to provide the best advice to uh, proper management. A side point from that, what is not research, but what needs to be done by policy is obviously reduce overfishing and illegal fishing to adapt exploitation levels to the severe impacts on the oceans. Another thing is to study novel consumption patterns. Can we eat other fish? And are these uh, new consumption patterns sustainable? For example, the picture you see here of a common bream, we're studying rediscovering unexploited target species that can be used for food. And that might even have ecosystem benefits like reducing eutrophication if we intensify exploitation of such species. And a third aspect is how to protect and design protected habitats to ensure that they can support fish production. For example, studying how we can increase connectivity of no fishing areas and marine protected areas to get the best effect out of them, which is something that Charlotte Bergstrom and her colleagues is uh, working on, and you will meet her shortly. So the main message here is life in the ocean is changing already now, so we need to act now. So in parallel to the knowledge production that SLU and other universities do, we need adaptation and mitigation already now. Thank you very much for your attention and thanks to all funders and colleagues and co-workers. You're most welcome to contact me and you'll find the contact information in the recording. Thanks a lot, Anna, for the brilliant presentation. So now we move on to some perspective, some of our junior scholars again. So it's time for Jenny. Uh, let's see if I can uh, spotlight you together with um, Isra. I'm going to find her here uh, soon. And there's Isra. So we, uh, we think that we are very lucky to have uh, Isra and Charlotte together with Lufunio and Amelie today, our very busy junior colleagues at, at SLU who, who is telling us a little bit about the day-to-day -day life. Now, Isra and Charlotte, Isra, would you please like to introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Isra Dafalla. I'm from Sudan. And uh, right now I'm, in, I'm at SLU as a Swedish Institute intern. I'm working on a project that analyzes SARS-CoV-2 from wastewater. Thank you. Charlotte, who are you? Yes, my name is Charlotte Bergstrom and I work as a researcher at uh, the Department of Aquatic Resources, the same as Anna Gordmark, who just presented um, at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. So you are the two people who are very much involved with our previous speakers research and maybe even contributed to some of that. Now, Isra, how did you find your way to SLU? Well, my, this project actually focuses very much in wastewater based epidemiology and SLU has a broad range uh, of both the theoretical and practical capacities within water sciences for such an interdisciplinary project. So managing and also understanding COVID-19 pandemic requires diverse measurements. I am very lucky to be part of a team that applies one, while also working and widening my technical and practical skills. That's fantastic. I'm very happy to hear, and we hope that we will find more candidates like you to join our teams in our different water-related challenges at the university. Charlotte, um, um, and why did you choose SLU? You've been with SLU for quite some time, I understand, although your work is uh, based in another part of the world. Could you tell us a little bit more? Yes. Um, well, I'll Part of my background is working in uh, developing countries in East Africa, I've done a lot of work um, and I did do my PhD studies in Australia. Uh, oh, sorry, in, I did do them in Stockholm, at Stockholm University, but my undergraduate is from Australia, um, working in tropical um, regions like Papua New Guinea, for example. Um, but um, so I, I do work a lot with management of aquatic resources, uh, both in developing countries, but also in, in uh, European waters. Um, 
and it spans from working with local fishes, small scale fisheries, um, to marine spatial planning in East Africa and in Europe, um, and uh, contributing to the sustainable development goals, um, particularly the no poverty, zero hunger and uh, life below water. Um, so that's uh, part of the stuff that I do at SLU and also uh, a lot of work related to marine protected areas and uh, the network of marine protected areas and connectivity that Anna Gordmark mentioned. So SLU really gives you an opportunity to continue your international connections and work that you started off even as an undergraduate. Well, thank you so much, Isra and Charlotte, for giving us those perspectives. And I'll hand over to Jens. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jenny, Isra and Charlotte for your discussions. So now it's time uh, for some questions and answer session. So I guess we have, you've been now stuffed with a lot of information and a lot of facts about what we do at uh, SLU. So please uh, post your question in the chat or in Pathable um, so we can um, uh, raise them to our speakers. And so far I have got three questions so which I would like to pose and they all come from Kievan Webb who is attending the seminar. So the first one I think goes out to Kevin. So Kievan wonders if human impacts are included in the water cycles, the water cycle would look different from where I live, a rural part of Thailand, to say to London. So please comment. Did you get the question, Kevin? Yes, I did. Um, well, the first thing is if humans are involved in the water cycle, changes in land use is something I think of the tropical regions. The, uh, if we change the forest cover, we change not only what happens locally, we've also focused on teleconnections. I mean, if rainforest goes in one area, will there be less rain in other areas? This takes us out of the traditional realm of catchment hydrology that looks at local perspectives. There's been a great interest more globally in how things will change. So I hope those are a few of the ways in which seeing people in the water cycle could change your area. The big challenge though, is to add dynamics to the water cycle. It's such a beautiful, elegant little diagram there, but when we get in change at the temporal dimension, that's where things get difficult. There are lots of neat things you can do on the internet that people have a computer and can, and you know, to make the water diagram more interactive, more dynamic, but um, we're working on it. Thanks. Great, thanks, Kevin. We have a second question and this goes out to Brendan. So Brendan, you talked about trees, but hedgerows are also important feature that could be planted alongside rivers. Has that been considered? Yeah, the focus of my project was a lot on trees, but one of the things, I mean, obviously today I showed some results of things which responded positively to planting trees, but there are some things which we which we value in landscapes which don't necessarily respond positively for trees. So for example, um, there's lots of species of organism which are more characteristic of grassland and meadow habitats and, and at a landscape scale, you probably want to maintain some of those habitats to maintain biodiversity in a larger perspective. And hedgerows um, absolutely can be, can be part of that. Um, I know in the UK, there's a lot of focus on hedgerows as being important for different types of bird species and that that could be could be a reason for having some areas of hedgerow habitat as well. So I think the idea is not necessarily just to <laughs> plant trees everywhere alongside streams and rivers. There's a lot of complexities involved. Um, it, it's more important to have a have a mosaic of different habitat types. And of course, that's I say that it, without even beginning to consider the human societal dimension that, you know, in cities, people aren't always positive about trees alongside streams and rivers if it increases the amount of wood in rivers, which then causes damage during floods, for example. So it's, it's very complex, but um, I think our results point to at least considering planting trees more widely as a management measure to mitigate environmental problems affecting streams and rivers. Thanks, Brendan. There's also a question to Anna CK, so uh, post by Kevin Webb. So can similar, a similar technique be used to estimate the opioids usage in a population by testing wastewaters? Yes, so as I mentioned, the illicit drugs can be also measured through this method. 
uh, actually cocaine is one of the most measured uh, substance, illegal substance, but uh, uh, I'm not uh, in the drug measurements uh, myself, but I know that it can be done. Already here, a lot of uh, interest in, in doing this kind of assessment, for example, in this pump station level, when we can detect how different neighborhoods are doing with their drug use, how, for example, criminal activities and drug use can be associated or police actions and so on. So yes, uh, different drugs can be measured at different efficacy. So as I said, uh, cocaine is one of those that has been, for example, recently one of our scientists uh, uh, Fun Yin Lai from our department works on this. They have made a measurement in Uppsala, our town of 200,000 uh, um, inhabitants. And they measured, if I remember well, that uh, about uh, 4,000 uh, lines of cocaine are consumed a week in our town, which is quite high. <laughs> At least for me, it was a quite surprising amount. So yes, it can be used for drug measurement. Thanks, Anna. Then we have a question to the second Anna, or in, it might also involve Charlotte. So uh, from Shaha Faisal, uh, who says, uh, asks, uh, we have a sea level rise and intrusion in Pakistan. And we as an in we as Ingo are working with fishermen communities to improve their livelihood. How the experts, how do you as experts recommend the best actions to support this initiative? Well, first I must say I support it. <laughs> and I think at that uh, uh, local scale, what you're bringing up is a really important question. With the sea level rise, we have salt intrusion, both for fresh water and it's also destroying uh, coastal uh, or changing at least coastal habitats where we, for example, have uh, juvenile fish production often, and it, also the infrastructure on the coast is, is um, suffering. So it's really important work that you're doing when you're supporting it. Uh, I uh, don't really want to give any local advice as I haven't studied there. I don't know if you want to uh, continue, Charlotte, with some of the more general perspectives on protected areas in the coastal side. Um, thank you, Anna. I, well, first of all, I'd like to say that I think one uh, key aspect is to is engagement. So I think by engaging the local resource users is, uh, is very important. So there's, there's a few studies that I've done where I've interviewed um, local resource resource users and tried to engage them and um, also ask them if their engagement matters and, and questions like this, uh, and it does. So I think that's the, the first thing to think about is, is engaging the local resource users as a, even as a researcher um, or in management. Um, and regarding marine protected areas, same thing there, if they're engaged in, um, in where to place them or how to manage them, then you'll have a higher success rate. In, in, in the management of these um, coastal regions. So um, uh, yeah, that's one of the sort of key messages or key aspects that I think is very important. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Charlotte and Anna. This goes another one. I think we have room for two more questions. So uh, there goes another one for on about climate change. So uh, to you, Anna, uh, what from uh, Naif Al Malki, so what is the main problem if increase if water temperatures in, at sea increases? Is it ozone or oil fracking? Did you get the question or do we need to ask uh, uh, Knife to, to spell it out more? I did, I did, well, oil fracking, I didn't really follow what the connection was to oil fracking in the question. So maybe specify the question. So perhaps you, you Knife, if, you, if possible, you can post the question orally. If you're still with us. One, uh, I, yeah, okay, so, great. Yeah. So uh, what I thought like uh, the problem is like you mentioned that uh, increase in water temperature in sea uh, near uh, coastal, uh, coastal areas. 
Um, I was wondering, is that uh, related to ozone uh, or like oil fracking, which like human made and causing increase in, in temperature uh, of the, of the like uh, coastal areas? I mean, on the scale that we're using um, oil as a fuel and producing carbon dioxide and creating the global warming, yes, it, that is contributing to the warming of the coastal areas and uh, the oceans. The uh, There is not any link to ozone, as far as I know, but that warming is uh, leading to that the ocean and coastal waters can, especially shallow waters, uh, can hold less oxygen. So that's another sort of second pressure on life in in uh, the water when it's warming up. It gets hotter or processes goes faster and the animals have less oxygen to support those processes. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Anna. Uh, and thanks, uh, Naif. So we have the last question posed by uh, Jose Pablo Murillo. So he would like to hear uh, our thoughts about including atmospheric rivers when talking about the source to sea system. Uh, it would be great if we can provide any benefits or and or challenges uh, including atmospheric rivers. So any one of you presenters would like to take this question? Perhaps you, Kevin, as a hydrologist. Can you say that one more to the question one more time? Uh, uh, Jose, I'd like to hear our thoughts about including atmospheric rivers when thinking about the source to sea system, any benefits or challenges? Oh, absolutely. The, the benefit is, is that, that those rivers are there and they're not been included in management. The challenge is, is we've been talking about integrated water management for decades. And the larger the scales you go, the harder it is to, to manage, to get the partners around the table. When we talk about these atmospheric rivers, we increase the scale of integrated water management from hundreds of kilometers to thousands of kilometers in area. I was involved in a paper talking about how deforestation of the Congo would threaten the mountain forests, uh, mount, the, mount, the waters of Ethiopia, and therefore the Nile and Egypt. And people were saying, well, this may be true, but why do you want to stir up this hornet's nest? We can't manage the Nile with riparian, the 12 riparian countries already. And you want to add another seven or eight countries to the sort of the, the negotiating table. So the challenges are enormous of thinking about how to manage atmospheric rivers, but they're there. Thanks a lot, Kevin. I think it's time to wrap up and round off this session. So um, first uh, I invite Jenny to say a few closing words. And then I'm gonna provide you with a slide on information where you can find more information on what we do at the SLU concerning water. So please, Jenny. Thank you very much, Jens, for these uh, last minutes. I just want to, first of all, uh, express my appreciation for all the participants that we've had in the audience here. And great that you have stayed with us. And I hope that you got a taster out of some of the Swedish University, Swedish uh, Agriculture University's um, water work across different fields, the environment, the agriculture, the forestry, the global, and the marine environment, of course. Um, uh, and also, including the human dimension and here we've had a few examples you also we also try to share some of our both senior and junior perspectives and uh, SLU as a Swedish university we have uh, of course a research mandate a higher education mandate but also a very strong mandate to reach out and communicate with policy and practitioners uh, both nationally and internationally as well as our fourth mandate on uh, national environmental monitoring making our university a very strong water uh, center um, uh, activity. I Finally, I, I would invite you as participants to share with your colleagues opportunities to engage with us as a student, as a researcher, or as a partner. And please come and check on our website and 
don't hesitate to come back or discuss or contact any of us um, if you're interested to continue these conversations. So thank you so much and uh, looking forward to engage with you. Over to you, Jens. Thanks, Jenny. So I'm going to just round off with showing some information. Uh, so where can you find us? Where, uh, there's a web address where we, uh, the water work at SLU are, are uh, collated. So at SLU Water Forum. And this web address is also in the Pathable platform. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, we have also a, a web page. We have pre-recorded films and material which, where you can watch, watch. And you can also contact me as a coordinator for SLU Water Forum or any of the speakers. Uh, I won't list all the uh, speakers' email addresses here, but you can contact me or uh, browse the World Water Week web for, for the contact information, I think. So uh, thanks a lot, anyone, everyone, for participating uh, and uh, for all the presenters. And we wish you a very nice continuation of the World Water Week 2021. And perhaps we see you all in 2022, perhaps live in Stockholm. Take good care, all of you. <laughs>